Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this uh, Lent Bible study, which will be led this evening by uh, our good friend, Reverend Adrian. And Adrian will be talking about uh, the joys of getting older, entitled The Meditations of a Caterpillar. Let us first uh, join together in prayer. <laughs> Dear Lord, we give you thanks for bringing us to this point in the day. We give you thanks for bringing us together this evening. And we pray that our discussions and conversation would be always bringing us closer to you and the truth of the saving power of your son, Jesus Christ, and his sacrifice for all of us on the cross. We pray this in his mighty name. Amen. 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 I will mute everybody except for Adrian. And Adrian, I invite you to um, fire away. I'll start again. Welcome, everybody. So good to see so many old friends. I start with a text. Uh, Psalm 71, verse 18. Forsake me not, O God, when I am old and grey-headed. So, the meditations of a caterpillar. Metamorphosis, or a change of form in one form or another, seems to me to be an almost universal feature of everything that God has made. A butterfly lays its eggs, the eggs become caterpillars, then the caterpillars change into a chrysalis, then Finally, the butterfly itself breaks out of the chrysalis and the whole process begins all over again. It's a constant process of metamorphosis, changing from one form to another. And human life is a process of constant change. You will remember going perhaps to a, a harvest supper or something of that kind and a competition is set. On the board are pinned photographs of the clergy and church wardens when they were babies. And the test is for you to guess which baby relates to which church officer. Who is who? And it's mighty difficult to know because from that stage of being a baby to being an adult, a great change has taken place. So getting older is my subject for this series of Bible studies on lament. And I can tell you there is some lament uh, to be made. I'm speaking, of course, from personal experience. As I myself grow older, as some of us do. When you are younger, you never consider what it will be like to grow older, to grow old. There are thoughts in my mind which relate to the past and the present and the future. We'll come to that in a minute. But this is not so much a study of a particular passage from the Bible about getting older, but it relates very closely to much of what the Bible seems to me to be saying. And the age of characters in the Bible is often a matter of some importance. So children are important. When God calls to Samuel, he's only a child. David is very young when he's bold enough to take on the mighty Goliath. And Jesus clearly held children to be of great importance. Indeed, you and I are to become like little children. To switch to the present day, uh, each uh, day at evening prayer, we use the Guildford calendar of prayer for each parish in the diocese. And it's relatively unusual for a parish not to have a member of staff particularly designated to look after youth or children or young families. 
But in the scriptures, older people also have a special place and seem in many respects to be highly uh, respected, to have a special place in God's plan. So in the New Testament, Elizabeth and Zechariah are parents for the first time in their old age. Simeon uh, seems to be relatively elderly and holds Jesus in his arms. He's been a temple servant for a long time. And Anna, even more so, deeply respected in the temple because of both her age and her holiness. In Mark 12, uh, 41, Jesus watches closely as an elderly widow puts her two small coins in the temple collection box and commends her generosity. In the Old Testament, on many occasions, characters are given a great age. Abraham and Sarah are parents to Isaac when they are, for goodness sake, 100 years old. And it's noted that Abraham was 175 when he died, Isaac 180, and Joseph 110. Not quite sure how accurate these uh, ages are, or is it just a general attitude of respect? If you turn to Genesis chapter 5, we have this uh, incredible gen genealogy between Adam and Noah, important people in a way, and they are given huge ages when they die. So Adam dies at 130, 930, Seth at 912, Enosh at 905, and the oldest of them all, Methuselah, at 969 years of age. These are huge ages, and no one is quite, quite sure why these great ages are given, except that they do give this atmosphere of respect. I particularly enjoy Enoch, although he's only lived for 365 years, a comparative youngster. Verse 24 says that he walked with God, then he was no more because God had taken him away. So the ages seem to be a matter of respect and value. But I am getting older and some of the experience of it I wanted to share with you. It's interesting that that, that, that same diocesan calendar of prayer has many special ministers for the children, but extraordinarily few, especially for those growing older, even though I have to say there are quite a lot of us. I have no intention of living to 969 or even 99. In fact, you and I never know what is just round the corner. I look at it in terms of past, present and future. <coughs> Take the present first. In a sense, this is the hardest part of life. I always say that things fall off from time to time. Slopes are easier for some than for others, but slopes have become extremely difficult for me. Memory plays tricks on us sometimes, or even disappears altogether. The, there's an extraordinary fact that your feet get further away the older you become. And there's much more too to be faced. You say to the doctor, I got this wrong with me, and the doctor replies, well, it's just your age, and you know then that there's no cure for it. 
you don't always see what you thought you saw. There's a song, my eyes are dim, I cannot see. Uh, I have not brought my specs with me, often sung by scouts and guides, also sung by soldiers originally in the First World War and by soldiers since, sometimes with words considerably early earthier than would be suitable for scouts or guides. There are rats, rats, big as alley cats, in the store, in the store, in the quartermaster's store. My eyes are dim, I cannot see. I have not brought my specs with me. Um, I thought by way of a, um, a, a, a little happy uh, interlude, we might listen to the song. Um, uh, everybody else has had music in their presentation so far, and I hadn't really got anything. So uh, here's my little uh, interlude um, for you uh, to dwell on, and you can sing and hum to yourself uh, as it happens. as you grow older. Here are the roots of our lament, but here also is the root of our faith, which is so important. God says to Joshua at the beginning of the book of Joshua, be strong and of good courage. I will be with you uh, wherever you go. Indeed, God has promised to be with me all through my life. In Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2, God says, You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you walk through fire, you will not be burnt. For I am the Lord your God, your Saviour. This is the promise. 
and in my experience it's true. Getting older was not something that Jesus experienced, of course. He died in his prime of life. His strength and relative youth were brought to an end in a single day. He died for us and rose again on the third day. And he did that because of his profound love for us. The result is that we are changed. As a result, getting older is changed too. And we are given a deep sense of hope. So that's the present. But secondly, the past too has a great deal to offer. It isn't wrong to look back and remember. And we look back over the years with a profound sense of gratitude. And God says to us through the prophet Jeremiah, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And all those memories, as they come back, you can detect God's love in each one of those memories. And then something that is profoundly true as we look back over all the good things of our lives, family, friends, childhood, growing up, getting married, watching our children and grandchildren grow up, particular events perhaps, our work, our career. There are moments when we've sensed that God is very close to us or that Jesus is calling us to do something or to be something or that somehow the divine is intervening in a mysterious way in our lives. I look back and I remember with great gratitude. But there is lament here too. The failures of our lives, choices which have clearly been the wrong ones. Maybe there's been a positive side to that in that it's increased our wisdom. I would add too the events of history particularly those close to our hearts, the Holocaust, apartheid, cruelty, oppression, poverty, homelessness, wars and so on. Will humanity never seem to learn? Climate change also. So much to lament in the history that has surrounded us in our lives. But then there is the future. There is much to look forward to, particularly the glory that is to come. But there are still things to be done. There's some work to do some care to give as we look outwards to the world which is in such great need. There are interests to follow. There is in a way more time for prayer and for reading perhaps, more time to study. I've taken advantage of that over these last few years. There are those interests to pursue Yet the one thing that you have to do on your own is the, in the end uh, to die. Here's the final metamorphosis. It sounds depressing to talk about it and yet it's true in the human sense and it's right that we do talk about it sometimes. Yet my faith tells me that there's far more to it than that. When I was baptized I was made a member of Christ. He is the good shepherd and will lead me through with my guardian angel at my side. I end with a vision 
the vision shared with us by St. John the Divine in Revelation chapter 21, in which he says, Behold, I will make all things new. And as we hear these familiar words, listen to them deep within us and in the context of our own lives, so we allow him to create within us, to recreate within us, indeed to make all, all things new. We may like to ponder on the meaning of the word new in this context, because it will involve the letting go of many of the things that we hold dear to ourselves, letting go of the old to take on the new. On the wild and windy shore of the small island of Iona off Scotland's western coast, there is a bay where Columba was said to have landed and brought the Christian faith to Scotland. In the sixth century, he set off from Ireland's northern coast in a boat so small that we would have been horrified even to row it on an inland lake. It was a hazardous journey across an utterly inhospitable stretch of sea. Once Columba had landed, he established his great centre of monasticism and evangelism. Celtic Christianity was established and was characterised by pilgrimage journeys undertaken without a clear understanding of the final destination. What they did have was a deep faith in God, the Lord of earth and sky and ocean. They let their lives go and offered them to him. I collected a few small stones from Columbus Bay. I look at them sometimes and ponder on my own pilgrimage. Sometimes I make the profound mistake of believing that I know where I am going, that I am in control. Far from wanting God to make all things new, I'm wanting him to bless the things that I plan rather than what he plans. In the silence of prayer, there is the opportunity to see whether we can let go of all that we feel is precious in our lives, trust him and listen to him saying to us, behold, I make all things new. John shares his vision of what heaven is going to be like. And there he sees that there will be no more pain or suffering, no more tears or death. Everything will be made new. It's a world where broken things are mended, sad things turned into joy, and where things that are somehow incomplete are brought to a wonderful and a glorious conclusion. So that passage from Revelation is so important as we think of that final metamorphosis from caterpillar to butterfly. But so too in St Paul in Romans 8, Paul sharing his conviction that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. So it is in the future that the final metamorphosis is complete. The caterpillar is changed into a butterfly and all is well and all manner of things shall be well in the everlasting presence of God himself. So now I've put up one or two questions for discussion, but uh, you can 
ask anything or say anything which relates to getting older that you that you wish. How do you speak with older people who are struggling with that lament which centers on pain or difficulty or disability? Maybe anxiety over what the future might hold. What passages from the Bible might help? How do you share your own faith in the life to come? Over to you. <laughs>